family. It's CJ Investing here. It's Tuesday before market close. And I just wanted to check out three stocks on my watch list that are down and that are down from their all their all time highs, 52 week highs. And these are dividend stocks. So without further ado, let's get into it. So the three stocks that I'm picking is Procter & Gamble. As you can see here, its 52 week high was 164.21. And it's at $155.88 right now. Currently down minus 1.56%. So the dividend rate is at, it pays 91 cents per share. A yield of 2.31%, so it's not too bad. So I'm going for some growth. EPS 5.7. So in terms of the analyst, it's undervalued at the moment. Their fair value rate is $166.14 on Fidelity. As you can see here. And that's their that are their parts of their business: fabric care, home care, baby and family care, beauty, healthcare, grooming. So let's just read a little bit about Procter and Gamble. I know y'all probably already know what it is, but for those who don't, it's a company that provides branded consumer package goods to consumers in North America, Latin America, Europe, the Asia Pacific, Greater China, India, the Middle East, and Africa. It operates in five segments, beauty, grooming, health, care, fabric, and home care, and baby, feminine, and family care. The beauty segment offers conditioners, shampoos, styling aids, treatments, anti-perspirants, and deodorants, personal cleansing, skin care products under the head and shoulders, herbal, Essentials, Pantene, Pantene, Rejoice, Olay, Old Spice, Safeguard, Secret, and SK11 brands. The Procter & Gamble Company was founded in 1837 and its headquarters in Cincinnati, Ohio. So, you've probably already used it before, most likely. The total revenue as of March 31st, 2022 was $79.62 billion, as you can see here. Institutional ownership was about 64%. Trailing PE, 27.64. Not too shabby. Price to book, 8. Profit margin is about 16.96%, which is pretty good. I would say. And the total debt to capital ratio is 39.29%, meaning they have more capital and debt, a lot more capital and debt. So that's a great sign. That's always something you want to look for. So that's always good. As you can see, they've been profitable, of course. Um, and they beat on their earnings from the estimates and that's always good as well I mean if they whenever they don't beat that just presents a buying opportunity because uh, as long term investors we know the company is going to come back the company isn't going nowhere just because they have a temporarily bad quarter so that's always presents a buying opportunity whenever they have a bad quarter or just an okay quarter. So their dividend payout ratio is 63.87%. So that's within, that's, I think that's a good range. The, per, the perfect range being like 40 to 60% or 40 to 70%, depending on what your metrics are. But those are mine. So that's a pretty good range, I would say. They have plenty of space to go to dividend. 
without paying too much of their earnings to their shareholders. So that's always a good thing. It's paying a healthy dividend. And the sentiment, long-term sentiment is strong. I don't put too much weight on that. What analysts think. Well, as you can see on this Yahoo Finance, on this, their balance sheet, the, the total cash they had was about $10.2 billion. Um, they had total assets of like $119 billion. The total current liabilities is 72.6 billion, so they have more assets than liabilities. Always a thing you want to see. They've been beating on earnings, of course, as I stated before, and their revenue is on the rise, which is a good thing. Their earnings kind of up and down because companies they have they have their stronger quarters, so. We're not too worried about that. So their gross profit was thirty eight point four billion because they they had total revenue, as I said before, at 79. You minus the cost of revenue, which is 41, you get 38. So that's good. They're, they're profitable. Net income. For March, was 3 billion. It was slightly down from the previous quarter. From the previous quarters, the, two, the last two quarters, but it's up from about from June of 2021. So it's still they're still going to be able to increase it. They're still expanding with their products and everything, and uh, we're getting plenty of revenue in. So no worries there. So let's move on to the next one. The next one is PepsiCo, Pepsi. Ticker symbol PEP. So let's check out their track record. So they had a high of $177.50. They're down to $166.98 right now. So a, a pretty, a little bit of a, um, a step down. It's a little, you have a buying opportunity right now. Dividend yield is 2.56%, which is around what Procter & Gamble was, maybe a little bit higher. So that's that's good. We're getting a decent yield. EPS of 7.44. So we got one buy rating. So we got one buy rating. We got five neutral, one underperform, one sell rating. So, so their uh, the analyst rating, what 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 they think is that it's undervalued, of course, at one hundred and sixty six. Dollars and 65 cents is what they see as fair value. As you can see, Frito Lay North America is the biggest part of their segment, followed by North America beverages, followed by Europe, um, Sub Saharan Africa, followed by Latin America, Asia, Middle East, and North Africa, followed by Quaker Foods North America. Those are their segments. As you can see here, as far as news, Frito Lay will begin the 8.3 million renovation of eggs. Arlington facility this week. Check this out. Frito Lay Frito is being get back to It's getting an 8.3 million makeover starting this week, according to a permit filed with the state. Construction is expected to begin Tuesday on. Renovation to plants 
storage and packaging areas as its facility at 948 Avenue H East. The construction is expected to be completed by early November. Frito Bay North America is working with engineering firm Pascal on its renovation. The Florida based company with offices in Frisco has previously worked with the Frito Bay to improve its supply chain operations through infrastructure upgrades in 15 states, including Texas and Georgia. The firm built two of Frito Lay's largest warehouses, complete with automated storage and retrieval systems. Frito Lay did not respond to requests for more information about updates to the facility. The company has been introducing automation and other efficiencies to this facility since 2019 when it announced that it would invest in a multi-year program to improve supply chain and production capabilities. Last year, Frito-Lay extended its so-called 2019 Productivity Plan for 2026 and placed an estimated $3.5 billion price tag on it. Frito-Lay last summer said that it would invest $200 million to expand a Texas manufacturing plant in Rosenberg and ramp up production of bunions and tortilla chips. Frito-Lay brought in $4.8 billion in revenue in the second quarter of 2022, a 14% increase over the same period a year ago, and $1.3 billion in profit for the parent company, Pepsi. So that was some of the news, recent news. And if you don't know, I mean, I'll read some of this. So PepsiCo manufactures, market distributes, and sells various beverages and convenient foods worldwide. The company operates through seven segments: Little Lay North America, Quaker Foods North America, PepsiCo Beverages North America, Latin Europe, Africa, Middle East, and South Asia and Asia Pacific, Australia, and New Zealand and China region. It provides dips, cheese flavored snacks, and spreads, as well as corn, potato tortilla chips, cereals, rice, pasta, mixes, and syrups, granola bars, grits, oatmeal, rice cakes, simply granola, and side dishes, beverage, concentrates, fountain syrups, and finished goods. Ready to serve tea, coffee, and juices, dairy products, and sparkling water, makers, and related products. So it's in a bunch of different places, a bunch of different grocery stores. They have an e-commerce platform. So y'all, we all know PepsiCo. And the total revenue as of March 31st of 2022 was 80.85 billion. They have a billion shares outstanding, 1.3 billion, which is a decent amount. It's quite a bit, but Trailing PE was 22.95, price to book 14.19. So it's a, the price to book is a little bit higher, but the price to earnings ratio is a little bit lower. So you wanna always see the, you wanna be looking for low price to book, low price to earnings ratio. Some people value price to earnings, others value price to book. Um, I personally look at price to earnings a little bit more because I like to see that I'm getting a good deal as far as with those earnings. I, I hold a little bit more weight on that. And they look like they're pretty cheap right now. The profit margin 26.30%. The total debt to capital. They have a, they have quite a bit more debt than the Procter & Gamble. They have 63.25% debt to equity ratio, but they still have more equity or capital than they do debt, which is always a good thing. It means they're healthy, they're a healthy company. And as you can see, they've been beating on earnings, beating on the estimates. And they've been maintaining their earnings, if not growing them. The dividend yield, of course, was 2.56%. Payout ratio 
is 58.82%. So that's a that's a really good payout ratio. That's what you want to see. It's right in, in that range. It's a little bit lower than Proctors and Gambles. Um, it's kind of in that golden range. So they have plenty of room to grow the dividend. And I believe they will. Annualized dividend is $4.30. So that's what you'll be receiving when you buy into this company. As you can see, they've been increasing their revenue. You know, from under 70 billion to 80 billion, which is a good thing. The earnings kind of stand steady. As you can see, they're profitable. They're bringing in 80 billion revenue, cost of revenue, 37 billion. Minus that, you get their gross profit, which is 43 billion, which is a little bit more than Project Gamble. It's a different sector. And as you can see, this is going from the previous quarters, 2021 and to 2022. And they've been increasing their net income as well, which is a good thing. That's a big jump from, what, 1 billion in December of 2021 to 4 billion in March. So that's a really good thing. So let's look at their assets. They have 92.9 billion in assets total. And total liabilities, they have about 74.6. So they have more assets than liabilities, which is good. Which is good. McDonald's. So as you can see here, the company McDonald's was at $269.69 at, at its highs. And now it's at $246.06, which is quite a dip. So you're getting a little bit of a deal there. The dividend rate is $1.38. So you're getting that per year. The yield is 2.24%. So, all of these companies are around 2% yield, so not bad. You have two buy ratings from the analysts, and you have, looks like, six neutral ratings. So, as far as what analysts think, they think it's undervalued because their fair value is, is at $296.87. As you can see, they got 50% in international operating markets, 41.9% in the U.S., 7.4% in international license. So that's that. As you can see, J.P. Morgan adjusted the price target on McDonald's from 275 to 260. So that affects the stock price. I don't put too much weight on that, as I said before. So, y'all yeah, all know McDonald's. They operate and franchises McDonald's restaurants in the United States and international. Offer hamburgers, cheeseburgers, chicken sandwiches, nuggets, wraps, fire salads. You know, all of that good stuff. The total revenue as of March 31st, 2022 was 23.76 billion they have less shares outstanding than PepsiCo 739 million looks like they all have around the same institutional ownership I think PepsiCo was around like 66 McDonald's was 68 I think the one before that was around 60 some percent. The profit margin 
is 19%. Always good that they're profitable, but we knew that. Price to earnings, 26.04. They don't have a price to book on here currently. Or total debt to capital. But their price to earnings is a little bit higher than I think PepsiCo. But it's still it's still reasonable. We're getting a little bit of a discount for what it was a couple of months ago. As you can see, they had about three quarters over the past two years, I guess, that they didn't beat on earnings. But they've They've been up from that. As you can see in Q2 of 2020, it was really affected by the pandemic. And that's understandable. That's a that's that's like a major slump from what they normally produce in quarter two. They produce earnings of about uh, two dollars or something on their quarter twos. From what I've seen. Um, the dividend yield is 2.24%. Payout ratio is 58.29%. So another great payout ratio in that golden range where you want to see 40 to 60%, 40 to 70% around that range. So that's great. Your analyzed dividend, $5.52. Revenue is overall on the rise. As you can see, it dipped a little bit in, in 2020, but it, it came back in 2021. So the total assets, 53.8 billion. Total liabilities, 58.4 billion. So, so they have more liabilities than assets, which is not, not as good as you would like. You don't want to see a company have more liabilities and assets. So that's a thing. To look out for that could be a red flag so there's that that could be a red flag if you're concerned about that if you're concerned that they won't be able to pay it off i i think they will personally that's just my opinion uh, their total revenue was 23.7 billion the cost of revenue 10 billion 10.8 billion and then you minus that from that and you get 12 billion for their gross profit, almost 13 billion. So it's not bad. It's, it's less profitable than the other two companies, but it's still a great company, especially if you go to this McDonald's restaurant and you like those are my three stocks that I chose that were on my watch list. I hope you all enjoyed this video. Remember to do your due diligence of your research on it. And, you know, choose wisely. Don't invest more than you're willing to risk. You know, just keep yourself educated. I appreciate y'all for tuning in again. Thank y'all. Y'all stay blessed. And I'll see you next time.